thread. And I'm just wondering uh, whether I can see the chat uh, stream when I'm sharing my screen. Possibly not. Um, possibly Don't worry, not. I, it's, something, it's something that I can monitor for you. Yeah. We, um, you can have a view at the end once you stop sharing. If you could, I might, yeah, I might need to uh, rely on you to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, let's crack on then. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, no, actually a little bit, first of all, about the, um, let me just go back one slide. Bear with me, bear with me. Yeah. So it's really good. To, it is really good to be here. I'm very nervous. I'm going to be really honest because this is not my subject matter. So um, I'm really, really interested in it though. And it ties in beautifully with a webinar that somebody else did for the Oxford College of Marketing called Improving Online Customer Experience in the Age of Impatience. That couldn't be more perfect tie-in with what we're doing today. And that webinar and all of the Lunch and Learn series are available to watch again you can download the slides today's will be added at the end of today's session and i've got a link at the end of the slides to enable you to to do that to access those um, so, so please do um, i first met red through the oxford college of marketing and i was trying to work out i think it was over 10 years ago it's probably more than 10 years, but it's over 10 years ago. And as she said, these days we keep in touch via Twitter. And I stupidly tweeted something about this subject and she invited me um, here. At, at, and that's why I'm here today. So thank you very much. These are our objectives today. The eagle-eyed marketeers and educators who are on the call will notice that these are not smart objectives. Hopefully you'll forgive me because the brief was to deliver an instructional webinar from which you can take away as much or as little as you find of interest. There will be some interaction and I'll use the meeting chat facility to do that. Red's going to support me with that because I can't see a meeting chat. Um, and there, there are heaps of references at the end. I have put in many, many, many links to the various research that I found in order to do this. And some of the uh, statistics are really, really fascinating. You might get, uh, depending on your, um, your source of information, sometimes uh, the stats are slightly different depending on the source. So to, to go, with, go with whatever's on the screen today or whatever I share with you, and you can sense check it with the references at the, um, at the end. Um, I must stress again, I am not a neuroscientist. <laughs> I think I'd quite like to be one, but I'm not. Um, neither am I an expert on digital dementia. But it is a subject that fascinates me. So today I'm going to share some of the research that I found. Hopefully hear some of your thoughts too. And because I'm not a neuroscientist, I do have a lot of notes. So please forgive me if I am glancing to one side or down as we move through. Wow, this is such, such a big area. Uh, we're, we're not going to talk about the progress over the last many, 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 many decades. Uh, you will be thrilled to hear. Um, I think digital technology has and do, does provide many really exciting opportunities. And it's incredibly useful. It allows a lot of us to do our jobs. It's allowed, from a teaching perspective, we've been able to carry on teaching. Um, and that hasn't been a, a sort of a secondary experience for I think either party. It's been more work for the teachers, um, but the feedback from students has been incredibly positive. So I do think it's very exciting. It's transformed our world. And it would have been hard to imagine back in the 1960s that we would have machines that would tell us what they'd replace books and newspapers. They'd tell us where we could go to eat. They give us directions how to get there. And these are things we now just take simply for granted. So I'm really interested to know how many times people have Googled today. Um, if you can just have a quick think and pop the number, and I bet you'll end up underestimating, but pop the number in the meeting chat. And I was thinking as I wrote that question, how many times have I Googled today? And I probably Googled between 20 and 30 times, I think. Um, today, but I'm aware sometimes, depending on what I'm doing, that it's, it's a much, much higher number than that. 
I think that technology is a force for good. And that said, I'm really keen today that we don't label anything that we're discussing today either as good or bad, because there are lots and lots of gray areas. Um, this webinar is more about the always on, the ever on, the 24 seven society, which digital technology enables. Um, in 2012, and other companies have done it subsequently, Volkswagen turned off BlackBerry emails after work because the unions representing staff said that the edges between work and home life were becoming too blurred. Uh, and I think that's a really, I think that's a really positive thing. There was a little bit of interesting discussion around that. You can Google if you want to read more. But I think we're too tempted. The minute we hear that little ping, Oh, we'll just look at it, we'll just look at that email or, or whatever it is, particularly if you're self-employed. Um, the temptation is great and I think we need to exert an awful lot of willpower not to read that emails. But in terms of Volkswagen, I think that was a really positive um, action from, from the company themselves. We are bombarded with content. The average consumer in modern day Britain is exposed to in excess of 5,000, just say that number again, 5,000 messages, many in the form of ads and sponsored messages on a daily basis. And that's compared with 500 during the 1970s. So um, I was thinking, was I surprised that it was only 5,000 if you think how far we've come with digital? But yeah, 500 during the 1970s and 5,000 today. Uh, one marketeer actually did his own experiment, and I'm horrified by this stat. Um, he said that he encountered a staggering 487 messages and promotions uh, before he'd finished his breakfast. I, I can't really get my head around that. Um, I, I, I think I just can't get my head around that. <laughs> I think it's huge. Um, relative to the size of the economy, the UK's online ad spend is ranked highest in the world at 0.63% of GDP. And this makes for an incredibly competitive arena for brands. However, the human brain is only capable of receiving and processing a certain amount of information before it reaches saturation. So at that point, marketing messages can become wallpaper, and consumers talk of being overwhelmed. There's a lot of talk of overwhelm at the moment, but we'll come back. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about lockdown and the virus, but there are, there's a couple of things I want to refer to. Um, interestingly, according to Nielsen, traditional paid for advertising, so TV, billboards, radio, they retain higher levels of trust. Trust is a massive subject in marketing. So they retain higher levels of trust than digital alternatives, and they often generate higher levels of subsequent search traffic. That's a really powerful statement. So the marketeers online, and maybe the educators too, what do you think about that? Are you surprised that traditional marketing um, engenders a higher level of trust? And perhaps the return on investment when we're talking about the search traffic is, is perhaps higher. I appreciate context plays a part, um, but I'd be interested to know what you think about that. If you could just pop any comments in the meeting chat, that would be great. While you're thinking and doing that, um, this, is a, <laughs> this is something I am dreadful at doing. Um, so still on the subject of content coming at us, I was interested to know how many people read everything that they bookmarked. Um, I don't have enough years left in my life to read or to watch everything that I save. And yet there is so much incredible and useful content out there. I don't know how we cherry pick what, what, what we actually make the time to watch. And I think that's a little bit in the camp of, of the overwhelm. So my question is, who's in control? Who's in control? Am I actively in control? Are you or are we being controlled by the technology and by the different devices that we have in our households? Uh, some consumers are taking steps to count the amount of advertising coming at them, uh, often through social media, especially millennials and young consumers. 
it was estimated that 43% of all internet users between the ages of 18 and 24 in the UK used an ad blocker in 2018. That's quite a high percentage. Um, we're encouraged to include regular digital detox into our lives, to exert willpower over our mobile phone usage, or if we can't, to use apps that restrict our time online. And yet, around 80% of people still check their phone before getting out of bed, and I am one of them. I don't know whether I should be embarrassed about that or not, um, but I am one of them. Smartphone separation anxiety is now a thing, uh, termed nobophobia, N-O-M-O -O phobia, one word. Uh, a phobia which induces panic or stress if someone is able to access or to use their mobile phone. And scientists say that this is because we view the, our phones literally as an extension of ourselves, um, which is I don't know, that's quite a frightening statistic, or, or research, um, I should say. And when I think of, speaking of teaching, my teaching hat on, not my marketeer's hat on, um, when we ask students to put their phones away, it's not an excuse. But they're literally, when we're talking about smartphone separation anxiety, it is actually a thing. So they may be genuinely feeling some level of stress or anxiety um, at that request. And it's really tricky because technology, the use of technology is encouraged in lessons. So on the one hand, we're saying, don't use your phone. And on the other hand, we're inviting them to do so. So it's, it's quite a tough area to, to manage, but it is a thing, it has a name. Um, thinking of gamers, which is quite often thrown into this debate um, from a negative perspective, we might be more inclined to think of gamers as being addicted to technology, despite the, the negative consequences uh, to the user. However, technolo technology addiction and impulse control disorder involves the obsessive use of mobile devices, the internet and video games. So you might scoff at that last statement, but developing a compulsive need to use your digital devices to the extent where it is interfering with your life and stopping you doing things that you need to do is the hallmark of an addiction. So back to my question, are we in control or have too many of us succumbed to an addiction without realising. I'm just going to read you some of the comments here before you carry on, Tracy. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple here. One saying, uh, my phone is controlling me. Uh, that's from Catherine. Stephanie, Stephanie is saying, uh, phone for sure is controlling me. Uh, Barry is saying he believes that the traditional media does earn more trust. Mm. Just a couple of comments in the chat. Thank room. you. Thank you very much, Red. So as technology moves faster, our patience grows thinner. I think I knew that anyway, but I found a lot of research to back that up. Uh, a survey of 6.7 million users showed that users abandon videos if they take more than two seconds to load. I'm sure it used to be longer than that, so we already shaved some time off. I mean, two seconds is a very short amount of time, but we don't even have patients sometimes to even get to, to the two seconds. Uh, according to the Nielsen Norman Group, most users only stay on a single web page long enough to read just 20% of the content. Now, if that's not a stat to focus the, uh, focus the mind on the quality of your website content, I, I don't know what is. Uh, the average Trending video length on YouTube is four minutes and 30 seconds, whereas the average TikTok video is closer to 30 seconds. Both apps have an average session duration of around 40 minutes. So in the same period of time, one user on TikTok is exposed to over 10 times as many creators on YouTube. Now, that was a stat from September 2019 and obviously pre-lockdown. TikTok has 
literally exploded since we've been in lockdown. So there are more recent stats. There's a whole heap of them and I've put them in the references. It's well worth taking a look at. Um, really, really interesting. So you know, love it or hate it, uh, TikTok, but <laughs> their time is now, their time is now. It'll be interesting to see how they develop the app um, going forward. So we'll uh, here's a watch this space. Um, social media feeds on and reinforces our need for instant and approving feedback. Students tell me they delete images if they don't get enough likes which I found astonishing. Um, this constant need for instant gratification in the virtual world can lead to poor choices and frustration in the real world. That's when it becomes concerning. Rates of teenage depression began to rise around 2012 when adolescent use of social media became common. Interestingly, it was higher with girls. And some evidence suggests that frequent users of social media have higher rates of depression and anxiety than light users. A Swansea University study found that heavy internet users experience psychological symptoms of withdrawal when they stop using. Totally in line with addiction. Um, and a study of Chinese youth uh, showed that internet addicted adolescents tended to have reduced grey matter, so our thinking stuff. And there, according to this research, they are suggesting that that was permanent damage, although that is very hotly debated online. So take, take some of that with a pinch of salt. Physical health problems include vision, uh, not unsurprisingly, hearing loss, neck strain, and weight gain uh, due to a lack of mobility. So, at its extreme, <laughs> it's not very good for us. <laughs> so looking at that bullet point list, when, when I put it into the slide, I did the same. I thought, right, which, which do I identify with? Which can I nod my head at? And absolutely, those first three bullet points, I would say yes. I do have difficulty in concentrating at certain times, and I absolutely know it's because some of the things that I've been talking about today. A short attention span, I don't know whether that's, that's worse because of um, digital or not. And <laughs> short term memory loss, I don't know. Is that an age thing or I don't know. So again, in the, in the chat box, I'd be interested to, well, as much as you're happy to share, which one of those do you associate with? Or maybe it's just all of them. Um, it will be really interested, interesting to know what you think. Um, so just based on that, I'm thinking, should we be more concerned? How much more is there to it? So before we get to digital dementia, let's just have a very quick look at dementia. Uh, there is a definition there for you to read. Uh, it's not my definition. Um, the word dementia involves a set of symptoms that may include memory loss and difficulties with thinking, problem solving and language. Um, the changes can be very small to start with, but sufferers of dementia, eventually it will impact um, a lot. Or at the, at, toward the end, I'm thinking my aunt actually, um, it can impact every area of their life. So it's, it's very debilitating. The speed in which it increases just depends on the individual. So it's impossible to, um, sort of plan, plan for these things, um, and mood and behaviour, uh, which can be, you can have been not very loving and then you can be terribly loving, vice versa. It's, um, yeah, there's no set pattern. In 2018, dementia was given as the leading cause of death in the UK, um, being listed on 12.8% of all death certificates. Very sombre advice. And there's a, uh, a slide with um, a few more stats for you. The fact that it was, um, has overtaken as the biggest uh, cause of death, I think we need to remember that people, more people are being diagnosed, people are living longer, and there is a change in the way, there has been a change in the way that deaths are recorded. So, 
take that into account when you're thinking about these uh, statistics. And there's another to show you um, how it overtook. So we're all familiar with the term use it or lose it, but in the case of digital dementia, it really is the case. But do we need to remember everything when we have smartphones and the internet at our disposal? Do we need the ability to read maps when Google Maps will literally talk us through the directions? What do you think? If you have any comments, pop them in the meeting chat. And whilst you're thinking about that, I'm also interested to know how many phone numbers you know of by heart. I know one, two. I know my own, I know my mobile number, and I know my mother's landline number. And that's because it's the same number as it was when I was growing up. I literally don't know anybody else's phone number, landline number, or mobile number at all. Um, it's funny, which have, sorry, I was going to say someone else actually put in the comments before you did, how many phone numbers can you remember? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, um, I've got some other comments here. Someone saying just my own phone number, four uh, family numbers, just my own number. Um, someone else said me neither. I used to load, uh, know loads. And myself, like you, Tracy, I remember, I think it's my mother's phone number, my own, uh, and a couple of office phone numbers, and that's about it. So it's, uh, and I'm, I'm, so I'm torn. You know, do, the question was, do, do we need to remember these things, or can we free up that space in our brains um, and use it in other ways. And then I suppose if we flip that thinking, are we using it in other ways or are we absorbing our responsibility to our devices and to the technology? It's an interesting one. I have been in, in the, uh, I think with directions and phone numbers, when I've lost, uh, battery power has gone. And I remember I was visiting somebody a long, long way away. And I thought, well, Tracy, you're just going to have to use your common sense here. And I don't think I even had a map in the car for some reason at the time either. And it's amazing how your senses will take over. So maybe, maybe it's a temporary thing. Um, I don't know. But the phone number thing, yeah, if, if, if I haven't got those to hand in a device, I'm, I'm, I'm completely stuffed, which isn't great. Um, coined by neuroscientist Manfred Spitzer, I was, I was slightly horrified to find um, something that he said he thinks that technology should be banned for all children, just banned. I personally don't agree with that because I think we, it, it's a tool, it's an important tool, and I think we need to teach youngsters how to use it and maybe about the balance to protect against um, digital dementia. So I don't know why he has that extreme view. I'm not an expert on him, um, but he, he is purported to have said that. Uh, here's the slide. This is how this whole webinar came about. Um, this is a slide that I use um, in, trying to think what the lesson topic is. It might be a lesson on critical thinking. And I ask the students to consider digital dementia and this is the, the specific slide that I use and ultimately in really simple terms it's a sensory mismatch so we have certain areas of our brain that are being under stimulated and one particular area of our brain that is being over stimulated and the result is this so a sensory mismatch I like that because it's nice and easy to um to, to understand because it is a very wordy subject. Uh, don't worry if you're trying to write any of that down because I'm going to move now to some slides uh, which explain just a little bit more about each of those areas of the brain. I have never produced a PowerPoint slide like this in my life. However, <laughs> I didn't want to cherry pick what I thought were the important points. Um, I wanted you to have access to the slides and for you to decide. Um, for me, um, leaping out is the understanding and reacting to the feelings of others. So that whole area of empathy, which I think is so incredibly vital. 
um, in many, many, many different ways. Um, if that is at risk, I think that's very concerning. And threaded throughout these other bullet points is a lot around social interaction, um, which again, if we forget how to do that, I think that's really scary, really frightening. Um, yeah. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave another few seconds because I suspect some people might be writing down certain bits while they're looking at that and I appreciate it. It's a very, very busy slide. Remember you can access these um, literally as a download. And it's a click download, you don't have to go through any um, registration. So the under simulation of the PMRF. I was going to practice what it's what it's long term <laughs> phrases, but I'm going to let you do that in your own time. Um, but it is there on the first um, part of the slide. There, um, this is quite a varied one, uh, and, and I'm focusing for the purpose of the webinar. I wanted to mention the, the last part. Depression and anxiety keeps coming up again and again and again, and it's not all social, me social media related. And again, I'm trying not to use the same phrases, but it's almost impossible. I think that is a scary stat. Um, the understimulation of the PMRF could lead to depression, anxiety, etc., etc. I do not have one class in five years. I think I've had one class, literally one class of students and they're various ages with apprentices, they can be up to 50, um, who is not being treated for anxiety or depression. Uh, and quite often you, I'll have several, which particularly with the young people is, 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 is very concerning in my opinion. Under stimulation of the, I don't know if it's parational or par parattal, <laughs> Pronounce it how you wish. Um, I think unsurprisingly, we know if we're very desk bound or if we're, you know, tapping away on our phones for long, long periods of time, we'll know that we'll get an ache in our wrists or a neck ache or a back ache. And when we're away from our devices, we find that we're moving easier. Um, the aches and pains go away, hopefully to some extent. Um, I haven't thought about the spatial awareness though. Um, so I don't know whether that resonates with anybody. That was something that, that I say I genuinely haven't thought about um, and how that ties in with the injury. Interesting. Here we've got the over stimulation. Most of them are under stimulation, but this one is an over stimulation. And <laughs> that is not good, <laughs> it's not good. No social connection, no problems to solve. Our brain is literally not having to work and information is coming at us and we're processing it on a, on a very sort of very, very low level. There's a slide, um, we're coming shortly to something by Susan Greenfield, a neuroscientist, and she uses um, in her presentations uh, a slide of um, a brain. Um, we shall cut it in half and it has its little branches and literally because we're not taking that further step in terms of processing and understanding and maybe communicating what we found out these little branches in our brain are becoming stunted I mean that, that is actual science in a visual format I mean, sadly I was trying to find one of her slides um, but, but I couldn't but not good and this one is uh, similar to one of the other under stimulations uh, to do with posture balance to an extent, but this goes further. It's about coordination, about speech even. Um, yeah, it was, I was trying to, in my mind's eye, when I was putting the slides together to draw the, when I was drawing the connection with one of the other parts of the brain to really establish what the extra bits were. And I think it's very much about the, the coordination of speech. Are gamers more at risk? 
Scientists behind this research have recommended that video games as a means of boosting older people's cognitive function should be avoided because they think they are actually harming um, their chances of uh, the, the dementia increasing. When you dig a little deeper, it depends on the type of video game that people are watching. So if they're watching, um, I think it's, yeah, they're saying shooter video games. So things like Call of Duty, if people are, let's use the word addicted, if they are addicted to playing games like that, there is a lot of research um, to back up that it is literally harming them. However, if they're addicted to computer games like Super Mario, it's fine. You can play away. I'm just thinking if I had a little bit of research to, to back up. Um, yeah, it, it's literally that simple. The difference between the type of computer game that you are addicted to. I don't know whether I agree completely with that because if you were still addicted to the Super Mario games, what we've already been discussing would still come into play. So it would still be an addiction. Um, healthy addiction? I don't know, I think, that's, um, I think that's a stretch too far. So this is a, a figure I've actually taken from, you can see this here. It's actually taken from this book by Susan Greenfield. There is a link at the end in the references. And I just wanted to read the supporting information for this particular image. Can I just have a quick sip? <clears throat> so she says, a continuous cycle of stimulation, arousal and reward in addiction that could account for a compulsion to play games. Typical gaming responses are fast and exciting leading to a higher level of arousal and release of dopamine. Dopamine also underlies rewarding experiences and addiction so that the behavior continues and yet more dopamine is released. This excessive dopamine will inhibit the prefrontal cortex to the degree that mindset is now compatible with various other conditions with the common denominator that actions are performed heedless of their consequences in the constant drive for sensation at the expense of a wider cognitive take on the world. The gaming experience meets this drive particularly well and so the cycle continues. Now I know that at least one person had asked um, about gaming content being included in this presentation today and I'm sharing a lot of research with you some of it I think is, is cause for concern, but as always, there's, there's balance to be found. I know a lot of people who do play Call of Duty, etc. Are they addicted? That's not for me to say, but I do think as in everything in life, it is a balance. Uh, but there's lots of fascinating uh, research that she's done as well as the other ones, so I recommend this book. It's an easy read. Not that that's a reason to, to, to look at it. Can we protect against digital dementia? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes or no? I'm just going to see what comes into the chat area. Yes, going to say. Chat area. Yes or no? Yes or no? I've got a yes, a yes, a yes. Yeah. More yeses. Quite a yes. lot of coming through. Yes, but by having a balance. Yes. Okay, so that there you go. Excellent. You're absolutely right. Um, we can protect against digital dementia. Uh, according to another neuroscientist called Eric Miller, he says that human brains are not wired to multitask well, and this is irrespective of gender. He explains that when people are multitasking, they're actually just switching from one task to another very rapidly. And every time they do, there's a cognitive cost in doing so. So 
essentially by being really productive in, you think you're being really productive and attempting multiple tasks at once you're actually being ineffective again i've done so much self-reflecting when i've been putting this together and i think i'm probably guilty of doing lots of things at once and if it's a specific project i i know that i have to switch every other distraction off i'll mute the whatsapp groups um, so that i that i have to concentrate on what i'm doing what else can we do uh, obvious things like setting times of the day to read your emails it doesn't work for me but i know a lot of people they do literally have set times when they will access their emails um, they're very strict on their mobile phone usage they will use the apps that won't allow um, push uh, activity to come towards them i don't use the apps I'm either really good or I might do a thing like at nine o'clock, I don't really want to be engaging online. So I literally won't have my phone on so I can't hear it pinging. It's whatever works for you. I think with children is where we have to be perhaps more mindful because obviously we are responsible for them, whether we are um, any sort of caregiver, parents, teachers. So for children up to two years of age, they should have zero screen time other than um, video calling, apparently that's okay. Um, but other than that, they should have zero screen time. Uh, children aged two to five, their screen use should be limited to one hour a day of high quality programs. Now, who decides the quality? That's, that's really, really subjective. Uh, and then I was trying to find some really good research on adult usage. And I think it's very difficult if our work is online because we don't sit down for seven, eight hours a day and only look at work stuff. Um, but trying to come up with a figure in my head and then backing it up with some research. In your leisure time, it's suggested that a couple of hours is probably healthy use. Just a couple of hours per day. I am way over that. Um, I got students in my class a couple of weeks ago we all looked at our mobile phone usage on um, where, where you can when it comes up with your percentage and whether you're higher or lower than the last week. And I was not too different to them. I think the highest person in the class from memory, I think she was nearly eight hours. So eight hours was her average on her phone per day. And then obviously it splits it down into um, what type of activity. But that's a lot. <laughs> it was astonishing. Then they were discussing how they used it, whether they watch YouTube videos, things like that. So, um, but yeah, that's a lot of time to be looking at your phone or at your iPad. Um, Tracy, there's an interesting comment here about yeah. that screen time include watching TV. And I think that's a really good point um, that, you know, I know many teenagers that use yeah. their phones to watch TV on. Um, and I look at my screen time and it's shocking. I've got nine hours on yeah. my iPad top plus four hours on my on my mobile yeah. screen and I'm not actually sure I have how to fit that into a day those um the the actual stats that I read out uh, that does include tv on the um on the phones they were watching some of them were even watching whole films on their phones so yes it wasn't just sort of nipping in and out it, it might have been watching tv as well so that's why I think you know context as, as ever always plays a part um, I don't watch, um, I don't watch programs on my phone. So I sometimes think how on earth, how on earth literally have, have I been four or five hours a day? Um, yeah, I think as long as you're mindful and you know, if you've got enough breakdown, depending on the phone you use, you'll, you'll get a breakdown of how that figure has um, been calculated. And I think it's about being mindful and knowing where you're spending your time. So if it says you've been on social media for four hours a day, eek, <laughs> and that's all leisure time. Um, I don't know, is that healthy? It depends, there's a, there's a lot of vices and addictions that are much more unhealthy. So I would never, I would never presume to, um, to tell somebody what their healthy amount was. Um, but yes, TV is an interesting one, TV. Um, because more and more people don't watch t 
TV, they just watch Netflix, etc. Be interesting to look at these stats in 20 years time, 10 years time, 20 years time. Um, and in terms of how we can protect the same things apply in terms of reversible. Yes, it is in the main, it is reversible. It is reversible. Um, going back to the use it or lose it, most of us have heard, keep doing crosswords as you get older, but actually that, that's great, keep doing your crosswords, but also it's really important that you learn new things. And if I had to pick anything out of that slide there, it's the learning new things and making sure that you're maintaining you know, a reasonable amount of exercise. I do not do the reasonable amount of exercise, um, which is really bad. So I'm not sitting here as a paragon of virtue. I am always learning something new though, always, always. And according to this, that's going to put me in very good stead in terms of preventing digital dementia. But I think it's, because it's a scary thing. And if you look at some of the um, research out there, you know, we might think, oh my gosh, we're all going to get this because we're all online all the time. Well, we're not, we're not. And even if we find ourselves, uh, there was the slide with a little bit of memory loss and things like that, we can build in practice into our daily lives to reverse, to reverse that, which I think is reassuring, <laughs> reassuring if nothing else. So first question, has your online behavior, your use of technology and your devices, has that changed during lockdown? So if it is, so regardless of whether it's yes or no, if you can put a little bit of information around that. So have you been online more? Have you been online less? What have you been doing instead if you haven't been online? I have definitely used less social media. Definitely, 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 definitely. I have no interest in it. Um, it pops me into the chat area I'm, I'm reading those out so sorry Red, say that again no saying I'll, I'll read those out I'm just waiting yeah. for people to thank you thank area. you so how has your online behavior changed if it has if it has during lockdown have you been on social media more or or not or not mine's certainly been less I've I had, yeah. had Twitter outages because I got so fed up that's oh, that's you red is it yeah yes that's me so yeah i uh i don't know i take i have noticed not that i follow it but i have been aware there's been less celebrity stuff online and i thought oh, that's interesting because we're led to believe that there is such voracious appetite for that and yet um, i'm talking about the the sensational stuff um there's a good comment here though uh someone said which i could totally also appreciate i've been on a lot more zoom calls <laughs> um, someone else says lots of zoom but uh making more time to go for a walk and read traditional books uh someone else is saying more social media scrolling for me loads of zoom calls uh, social media about the, uh, about the same, but time on Zoom, Skype, instead of sitting in the pub. Um, probably more as talking and seeing friends through technology. So yeah. yeah. So social media has taken a bit of a backseat. It'll be, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see when it, when it changes, if it changes. So I think a lot of us have found, um, there are some people on this call that I would not have, almost certainly would have not connected with had it not been for the lockdown. Um, we communicate through WhatsApp and through very regular, oh, well that's very regular, the WhatsApp group is on fire all the time. And the, uh, we have various Zoom um, meetings each week as well. Uh, and that's been fantastic. It's like continuous CPD, and everybody's so supportive. So that's been an absolute joy. Um, and with families, I don't, nobody mentioned family, I don't think in the chat, um, but all of our family, including the Canadian relatives, we all get together once a week and that's lovely. And we, ne we never used to do that. And we said we're going to carry on doing it. Um, maybe not once a week, but at least once a month when um, everything reverts to normal. So interesting times. I like the, I like the forced pause, so giving us a chance to reflect, um, maybe to make some changes. I think a lot of people will be making big career changes, some of them sadly enforced, but I think some people will 
will make big decisions career-wise. Right, your two meaty questions. Um, it, it, it is aimed to marketers, but there's no reason why everybody can't um, comment on that. Um, I've been mentioning content which is very specific to marketing as I've gone through the presentation. And it's a big question, but what responsibility, if any, do we have as marketers to protect our audiences against digital dementia? So question one, if you could ponder that for a few seconds. Or do we uh, jump on the TikTok-like bandwagon and just, you know, because it's about delivering content in a way that is accessible to our audience, as you know, I'm teaching you to suck eggs. Um, but if they want it in bite-sized chunks and they want it quickly and they don't want to have to work hard for the information, then who are we to say, no, 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 it's good for your health. <laughs> because as I say, we're, we're there to deliver them the content in an accessible way. So that's a, that's a bit of a, actually ethics, ethics comes into both of these questions. Um, so you might think we have no responsibility and it's completely up to the consumers. Let me know if it's coming through, Red. Yep, I'm just having a look here. Let's have a look. Uh, we must ensure what we share is truthful and useful, fake news and mindless sharing everywhere when the actual news stories are scary enough. That's a really good point. Yes, we do. In the same way, we have to be responsible for data protection, honest advertising. Uh, I think we are responsible and we should be the solution, not the problem. Maybe we should not exaggerate with automation and chatbots. Uh, some more public care messages. 30 second demonstrations bite size. Someone's just mentioned that. I'm not sure how that, are we talking about that? Uh, oh, so uh, I'm trying to engage um, through humans with our clients, some more things that are coming through. So it's interesting, interesting. Interesting. Uh, hang on, uh, the links, uh, this links well to teaching too. Should we bombard learners with emails? <laughs> yeah. At that point, I'm going to mute. <laughs> I, I, that's a really, that's a really, well, they're all really good points. Um, and I'm looking forward after, when, when we've stopped the webinar, to actually reading those again. This, this whole business of overwhelm, um, it, it's, maybe that's going to be, become a thing and it's going to be called something else. Um, I think it's a real problem. And I find myself switching off from things because it's just too overwhelming. And so I will just literally draw the line. Um, and I think that can happen. So if I put my consumer head on, um, oh, it's so difficult. Um, I probably tend to shut down most pop-up messages that come at me when I'm searching online, unless it's something that's really of interest. Um, it's such a huge debate. You could probably literally have a whole, a whole session on that. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's, who's taken the time to comment um, on, on either of those questions. Did anybody else have anything to say on anything more to say on question two? I know some people just answered for both, um, but if you do, just pop it in the in the meeting chat, and I can look at that afterwards. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> is your your whistle stop? into digital dementia. I hope that for some of you who were completely unaware of this, I hope you found it interesting. If you were aware of it, I hope that you've learned a little bit of extra research that maybe you can use in your work or your teaching. And just to remind you that you can access, uh, there are six, six webinars, and they're all free to download, um, as are the slides. So talking about access, how we'd like to access content, you can just look at the slides or you can watch the video. And I presume that they're going to be there um, probably as evergreen content for you to enjoy. Um, before I sign off, are there any final questions?
just getting some nice comments for you here um, that it was very useful. Um, time well spent, it was fantastic. Loved your images and stats. Um, very informative, would love to share this with colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much for adding knowledge. Um, lots of new areas explored. Don't know if there are any other questions. Just lots of thank yous, which is nice. Oh, we always like a thank you, Red. Um, and I'm just, just, just while you're, um, this is the amount of, uh, which one am I going? That's the amount. <laughs> That's the amount of extra research you can dive into if you want. So um, I'm hoping I've included links to everything that I've shared here. Um, but also you can always do your own research as well. But it is a really, it's a really fascinating subject. And I think we all need to be aware of it. Thank Absolutely. you very much for the invitation to do this, Red. You're very welcome, and thank you so much. I, I, it, it was really, really interesting for me. Some of the stats in there were absolutely fascinating, and certainly food for thought for marketers as well. Um, and yes, thank you again for everyone who attended. You'll be delighted to know that we will be continuing our uh, lunchtime webinars under a new name uh, from next week. Uh, so keep an eye on our social media platforms, and we will be revealing more from Monday. Thanks so much for your time, everyone. Take care. Do our Zoom wave. Our Zoom wave that we've all worked on. <laughs>